Welcome everyone. We have myself, Michael, Andrew, Jan, Daniel, John, Sam, Stu, Jesse, and others trickling in. This is the first open ZFS production users call based loosely on the Beehive and jail slash zones production user calls. These evolve from developer calls. And I think one of the perfect examples of a successful call was when someone mentioned timekeeping in virtual environments. And that quickly branched into a two or so hour long discussion on site specific timekeeping and then cabinet and host and VM and pair virtualized clocks. And I don't think that topic's been addressed anywhere and it was very valuable and you can find that mention in the beehive notes linked at the top of the doc the doc is your friend it is the ideas it is the running minutes i do my best to keep track of what people are saying the acronyms can be challenging especially system calls etc so please jump in and correct them as needed uh, I want this accurately documented for those who can't attend, for those who want to copy and paste, and uh, first verifying what it does, and going on from there. I have put a bunch of topics at the topics ideas, such as tracing on ZFS, and I've I noticed some issues with the documentation on encryption and. Uh, Fortunately, many of you have been on the Beehive and other calls, so I see someone jumping in right in there. So go ahead, and I see an emerging topic per VDEV Q depth for hybrid flash. Ooh, I like it, yes. Uh, while this person is typing, go ahead and vocalize some of your concerns and ideas that you wanna have addressed in calls like this. Anyone? Early access to stuff like, you know, direct IO for testing and validation. Okay, uh, always have a link handy. If you have a link for direct IO, and is that, for example, specific to an OS? Any Linux. Any Linux, okay. Uh, yeah. But it was, off of, it was off the Atkinson presentation that came out in May. Of which presentation? Uh, the Atkinson presentation. Atkinson, do you have a link to that? Yep, let me okay. uh, stand by. Yep, thank you. Uh, and just drop in chat or in the doc, either works. I will find a home for stuff. Atkinson presentation, okay, cool. Um, and I will generally put in uh, placeholders like this. Cool, thank you. Um, and that was at Storage Conference US. Excellent. Okay. We've been, we've been waiting for direct IO for years. So I was just every, every time it comes up, it's like, okay, when can I play? When can I play? Okay. Got it. Um, now, of the topics so far, does anyone have a topic that they are losing sleep over and really want to get some eyes on? That's awesome. Um, okay, then go ahead and give the group a crash course on what Direct IO promises to deliver. And what, and go ahead and briefly introduce yourself. Um, Stu Redfield, uh, work for Digital Glue slash Creative Space. Um, we leverage ZFS in our um, managed storage solutions. Um, so that's something that's critical. We've got it deployed 60 some odd servers around the country, around the US, um, ranging in scale from four drives up to um, 208. Um, so cool. this week, that's usually around 12, 24s, those are our normal customer bases, but we're actually integrating with um, Nereads Ultra IO system and Direct IO will make that system scream because it's taking all of the RAID level off of it. And 
just doing straight direct IO. Um, so the speed up there should be in the three to four times would be my estimate. Um, again, without testing, but those are the, the type of things that for a media environment are critical for processing um, large video files. And uh, what you hinted at the fact that you're on Linux and is that something you've ruled yourself? Is that an appliance based on Linux or something else? It's our, it's our appliance. So it's a creative space product. Okay. Uh, but it is Ubuntu Debian based. Um, it does work on other distros, but those are our, our primary. And is that hardware and software? Yes. Okay. And it's Nyriad, N N Y R I A D. Uh, yeah, and if you're on the dock, go ahead and jump in and fix that. Um, I will do my best to both hear it and multitask yeah. in a no worries. distribution. So let's do a quick look uh, at what is going on here. Yeah, the the biggest thing is uh, from that presentation is um, sixteen or page sixteen. Okay. But it's a good read. I've seen presentations on it before. Um, it was brought up at the last dev conference, the last couple dev conferences as well. Um, but the read and write performance um, in handling, especially 6K and 8K video files, um, it's a not a game changer, it's a life changer. And is that purely in... ZFS or in the kernel or both or networking or what? Give us it's a kind of crash course. Prim here. It's primarily in the ZFS stack. Okay. Um, running multi-path, 100 gig um, connectivity. I can make it scream um, the ZFS level even in a you know striped volume environment, no, no RAID. Um, because that's all handled with the the Nereid slash Ultra IO magic um, is really really efficient, um, and they can handle ten percent um, failure rates of drives and still be performant. Um, but the ZFS primarily for the access as well as the the snapshot ability is what's critical to our customer base. Here you go. Uh, is there anyone present who can talk about direct IO or are we purely at the mercy of that presentation and reaching out to Atkins? I'm reading your comments, Jan. So the only things uh, I know about direct IO is what uh, has been written about direct IO and how it was important at the time to IREX on SGI server hardware to get around the serialization profile of IO and buffer caching. I see several problems uh, with direct IO and um, the copy on write uh, path copying B tree in that ZFS because uh, unless you give up on the end to end checksumming, every direct Synchronous write would result in materializing a transaction. So either they are not, uh, unlike the original ones, uncached writes, or performance would have to be terrible, I think, because basically every sync write would be a transaction group. So, what are the trade offs allowing you to get good? A write performance using direct uh, I.O. Uh, Stu, any thoughts on that? Or observations, how that wouldn't be the case? I All I'm basing it on is information I've heard. Um, okay. I, am, I am not a ZFS developer at all. Um, I rarely go into the, into the code base. 
Um, mm -hmm. But from a normal performance standpoint, the promise is there. And that's, again, why I want to be able to start mm -hmm. testing it at scale because, sooner rather than later. Because if I remember correctly, what uh, IREX did at the time was basically to pin the buffers and uh, do DMA directly back and forth which ZFS can't do unless it removes user space wide access to the pages because otherwise the pages could be modified from user space uh, after the checksum has been computed. So I'm really interested in how you can, how much of the real direct IO performance advantages you can get using the normal uh, O-direct flag. Right, no, and exactly the same here. And then, you know, what happens at desktop level testing versus VM testing versus, mm -hmm. you know, multi-petabyte testing, you know, that's that's really where the, where my interest is peaked. Um, yeah, every, everything promises the world, but until we can test it, um, I'm not betting my bonus on it. Okay, well, thanks for bringing that to our collective attention. I also have a vested interest in high performance CFS. So let's shift gears to, I've, go ahead, Andrew. I was gonna you? say, I think, you know, I think one of the caveats here is we have, we have to bear in mind that it's real easy to increase performance of ZFS if you're willing to throw away all the protections it offers you. And this, would you say this is a, a safer strategy? I have no idea. I, I'm, I'm with, with John there. I, we, have, we need to look at exactly what all the implications are. It's not just the implications, but the API contract you want to uh, offer to user space. Yeah. Because ZFS, uh, so far on all platforms offers a stronger API contract than just POSIX file system semantics about atomicity of operations, uh, ordering of operations and so on. And there have been some database applications written to take advantage of this, which are only uh, correct on a ZFS system or an even more conservative safe file system. And direct IO is designed to put the application developer in control. But ZFS uh, can't trust the application to, for example, not uh, change a buffer after it has been submitted from a different thread. So that if you have a multi threaded application, ZFS can't just trust user space not to have a race there and overwrite a buffer while it's in transfer. So either the buffer has to be mapped as unwritable, which is expensive because you have to change the TLB or it has to be copied, which is also expensive at these speeds. <laughs> that said, let's segue into MMAP on different platforms, which I suspect might also be performance related. Uh, who contributed that one? That's my question because I have only heard uh, anecdotes and sometimes platform specific guides, but not something because uh, ZFS with its arc isn't integrated into the normal FreeBSD or Linux um, buffer cache. So it's a second class citizen there when it comes to memory mapping things, especially with arc compression because those MMAP pages can't be compressed if they're really MMAPed. Uh, so there has to be a small pool of uncompressed pages. And I just wanted to know if, so, if there's an authoritative write-up on how the system is expected to behave. Uh, Can anyone point to resources for that? or additional anecdotes? Okay, noted. So at least it's on our collective radar. 
record size compression and writing amplification, amplification deserves its own meeting that I've, I've seen remarkable things in, in, in the wild such that let's, let's save that one for later. Uh, let's kick this over. Uh, who mentioned the per video? Let's see. That comes from my experience with hybrid uh, ZFS systems, where at least in FreeBSD 12 and 13, it's a global uh, source CTL, mm -hmm. the Q depth per VDEV and so on. And there is no correct value for a hybrid pool because either you're not making a good use of your uh, flash storage because it's not being run at the right Q depth. So it just empties the queue and sits idle or uh, you suffer from high latency on your spinning disks or um, a remote block storage devices like iSCSI because uh, there the QDEP may be useful, but it results in such a high Q latency for a queued operation to get through the whole uh, queue that it's really uh, annoying for interactive usage. And users tend to notice if your file server takes half a second for operations expected to be fast. Sure. Yeah. This has been a long-term issue in a TrueNAS context. And I know Mav and Alan Jude were looking yeah. at options there. So uh, you're not alone in observing that. And once again, Alan... does anyone present have some ideas on that or news to report? I know that Alan was working or at least looking into per VDEV uh, properties to turn this from a He's... global setting into yes. a into a nested level or you could have one at the pool level to tune the pool and then have properties, not just at the pool or data set level, but also at the VDEV level so that you could configure it per VDEV, maybe even per disk. I don't know if you wanted to go that far down. Understood. Because normally you expect to have uh, identical performance properties among the block devices in a VDEV. Okay. Uh, Sam, as a relative newcomer, we have many familiar faces. Uh, do you have any topics and top concerns? Uh, I don't have any topics or concerns, mostly just present to tune in and listen. Um, I, I'm employed at Purdue University in the Rosen Center for Advanced Computing. So we use ZFS in various spots on Linux to serve up home directories and do various backend things. Um, these types of calls are pretty popular in the, the research community um, overall. So mostly just here to say hi and hang out. I usually, uh, I watch the developer calls usually, but I'm not on those because of when they occur. So this one lines up a little better with my schedule and seeing as I'm mostly an end user anyway. Um, Understood, yeah. yeah. And yeah, it was a natural kind of segue there for those reasons. Uh, are there any public resources on your deployments, presentations? Uh, we certainly have some high level ones over our entire system. I don't think we have any specifically on ZFS. Um, most of the stuff that we serve with that is either like user home directories or internal things to our team. Um, so I'm not sure we published much about that. Okay. Are you virtualizing those Linux machines just out of curiosity or are you? Uh, we, we do, I mean, we have some ongoing efforts to do cloud type work, but, uh, we are an HPC center. So pretty much all of our systems are, are on-prem hardware. Okay. I was curious because I've been trying to check out performance for, uh, ZFS, excuse me, ZFS on top of, a, a sorry, ZFS host with the ZFS virtual machine as well. And I was trying to see if you had any experience of basically having ZFS on ZFS in regards to uh, virtualization environment. Okay, yeah, I've never personally tried that. Um, the most I've done similar is is just trying to serve uh, things to Kubernetes via ZFS and some of the community plugins that exist now. Uh, I haven't done ZFS on ZFS. So I can speak uh, from um, my experience that with ZFS and ZFS, uh, you probably want to uh, pass through uh, the storage in the form of uh, ZFS uh, 
volumes instead of using files. Because they all set evolve. The, yeah, exactly. Set of, and then set the a primary cache property of the volume to metadata only to exclude double caching the data because otherwise both the host and the guest will run the heuristics to decide what to cache and will probably cache the same thing while fighting over the same physical memory to cache it in. But you still want to cache the metadata so that the lookup of where your blocks are allocated is fast. The other problem is that ZFS doesn't have a fixed uh, block size like other simpler file systems. So there's no obviously optimal um, volume block size. And there are different trade-offs to be made and arguments on where do you want to compress your data if you want to compress. The other problem is that if you're using any form of parity rate that ZFS uh, rate Z, um, can only allocate full stripes. So you, um, independent of your block effective block size, you always have to write out a fixed number of parity blocks distributed over your Z-Wall. So um, some um, block sizes result in excessive padding, which is just wasted space. So for block size virtualization, you probably want to run a mirror pool both for performance and the parity overhead reasons. So you're saying that TFS and TFS isn't bad, you just have to configure it a lot. You have to, there are a lot of knobs to turn and uh, there is no obvious correct or wrong way to do it. Something there are a few wrong ways. Be, <laughs> there are a lot of obviously <laughs> wrong ways, but <laughs> there aren't obviously Absolutely. optimal configurations. Naturally. And there can be, uh, arguments made in both directions. For example, passing huge one megabyte chunks to your guest may allow you to get good compression. And for a read heavy workload, that could be worth it, especially if you have uh, something like um, a dedicated lock device or maybe even special location classes for small writes to uh, keep latency down and just take the a write amplification hit for the read modify write if you have a subscribe rewrites because you get better compression that way. And in the end, this may give you more effective bandwidth, but it can also be the other way around that you're totally limited by a synchronous write throughput with all your write amplification and suffer terrible latency and low throughput. So it really has to be measured uh, under realistic workloads and push beyond your expected workload to understand how it may break because you don't want to be close to some kind of tipping point, for example, with accidentally double caching, where what can happen is that it works for a few months until your data set goes to the point that you're really making good use of your memory. And then suddenly you get ZFS on the host and in the guest, uh, both going into arc shrink king um, death spirals, basically, that they grow up and grow down and every and while they're shrinking the arc, everything comes to a hold so that your, for example, your database may works as expected. It stops for a few seconds, then it continues working. And everyone mm -hmm. is scratching That would explain a few things on my tests. So I, I, I've done uh, Ubuntu with ZFS because they had the native option in part in their installer utility to automatically install ZFS. Uh, so I had Linux tried that on, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I had tried Linux that a few times. In particular, at, have and been a question one at a time. Sorry. Um, Mark, wrap up on that, and then Daniel, go ahead. But yeah, running a few Ubuntu slash Debian installations that have ZFS as native root, I've had it to where, like you're saying, every couple of hours, so for three or four seconds, the entire system will kind of actually lock up, but it's it's obviously oh. doing some disk I.O. And then once it does, once it passes through that, it's just fine like it was. So that was why I was asking if anybody else has had experience with it, because I don't know what to expect, and I'm doing the defaults. So it's kind of good to know that I need to adjust the metadata stuff. 
and then also worry about the right amplification. So and I have plenty of disk space, to, uh, so I'm not really too worried about disk space right now, but that may become a problem. The next thing you may want to look into is to prevent this growing and shrinking by basically partitioning your physical memory almost statically, for example, by wiring, wiring down it. your your guest memory so that you don't suffer any random delays there. Uh, one of the worst things about uh, this is, for example, if you have a spin lock in uh, the guest kernel and the page just gets paged out, suddenly what is supposed to be a few instruction long uh, critical section is in reality a page fold on the host. <laughs> so instead of tens of uh, nanoseconds, it takes uh, tens of micro or even milliseconds. Well, Daniel, the... what have you seen? I, I just wanted to mention uh, two asterisks in, in, uh, in these things. First of all, yeah, absolutely. Uh, primary cache metadata if it's a Linux host, because in Linux, it pretty much wants to cache the disk. Uh, there aren't a ton of tunables there. Um, for I think any Linux uh, file systems, there, there may be a few. Um, for Windows, Windows watch out because uh, oh, depending yes. on, if, if it, it will detect that it's a VM, it'll turn off its own cache. So you need metadata mm. cache on, I'm, I'm sorry, you need all caching on for, for Windows guests. Um, Windows that, ZFS, something that- Like they're running ZFS uh, to the root? No, or a I'm ZFS sorry. Host, so I'm the, the, okay, okay. A, a, yeah, on a ZFS host, right? A, a Windows, a Windows guest on a ZFS host. Mm -hmm. Also, I do want to mention something about the Zvols, which is is I think a bug that is that is known. Um, so right now, the Zvol, the way that it manages its space, is it actually has a, a secret quota that's set, and what that that's no problem. Zvols work great under you know, 99% of situations, unless you're stressing the hard drive like crazy. Um, the Zvol has a bug where it sees it itself getting close to the quota and it'll throttle it. So you don't get great um, great performance on a, on a full stressed Zvol. Um, so that's the reason why there's been a rumor floating around that, that Zvols perform worse than, than uh, files for guest VMs. Um, it's actually it's actually a little bit of a bug um, and only happens at the extreme ends of the test, like when you're benchmarking. Um, typically it doesn't really, yeah, typically it doesn't it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a secret. So if you hear somebody say, oh no, definitely use a file for your guest VMs, well, there's there's a big asterisk there. It almost never matters, and there can be a lot of handy things about using a Zval. But this, this was a secret that was driving me crazy for years, and now I understand uh, what was happening there. And we're talking about disclosed I.O., not space. to use files. And Hold on, one at a time. Was and, it Mark first? And I know, Jan, you've got uh, across the Atlantic latency. So uh, go ahead. Who, who asked about space versus performance? You were saying, stressing it. You're talking about stressing just the, the I.O. on it, not necessarily the space, because the 80% uh, like bug, more not necessarily bug, but where you start losing performance after your disk is over eighty percent full, that's a separate issue, right? Yeah. So we're just talking okay. about a specific Zvol. So it's when okay. that it's when that Zvol. So you set a you set a specific size, right? So imagine you're making a VM. It's a hundred gig, hundred gig. So you make a hundred gig Zvol, and then you know rather than a hundred gig file. So you're using the the Zvol. Right. The Zvol uses a quota. And it will throttle just that Z vault. It won't affect the rest of the pool. The rest okay. of the pool is fine. So you'll just see that VM's performance degrade uh, because it's a Z vault. However, I do recommend that you do experiment with both Z vaults and files because you get uh, some slightly different things out of them. Give some examples. Keep it coming. Oh, some examples of why files and and uh, Z vaults. Things, yeah, things you have observed. Let's let's go there. Yeah, I like, um, well, I like just having a different um, uh, volume per disk. And there's just a, there's a little more flexibility because you can directly uh, specify. Um, I mean, I guess you could create folders or volumes and it's just, it's just like, it's extra work to create 
a volume, put a single file in it and so on, just as Zvol um, is, uh, you know, uh, is a you know it's basically just a virtual virtual disk like any other on your system um you know and i also like it i like it better for you know for sort of cloning for organization for organizing lots of lots of disks so i have a um i have one volume that contains a couple of files with the uh with a vm configuration and then i have the zvols for each of the each of the drives which I think is a really clean way to uh, to organize things. You know, so I mean, it's, it's data set for configuration, and that's globally or per VM. Per VM, yeah. Okay. I oh, okay. Do, I cool. do per, yeah, and then I and then I clone the VM with the children, and the children are, are Zvols, and those Zvols uh, you could clone straight to a disk and boot off of it if you um, if you put it on metal. So um, that's like you know, I mean, or... obviously you can do. Yeah, exactly. DVD, okay. but, I mean, obviously, you can do that. You can do that with a file, also. Sure. Um, I just, I just happen to, I just happen to like it for, um, for, for cleanliness, for management, uh, for, for consistency, and uh, you know, and and so on. I mean, it's it's definitely there's a definitely big chunk of style choice here. Yes, and dragging a disk image to another system is very tangible to a non ZFS user. And I've had people sit down at a system. And it's like, there's no storage there. What do you mean? How did anything work? But it's all hidden in Z falls and they eventually work their way. Yes. Well, so I've, that, I've so also, <laughs> yeah. And, and there's also, I've had a, I've had an engineer accidentally RM dash RF the wrong, uh, the wrong folder and nothing was lost because it was right. a volume. So, there you, go. Okay. <laughs> you know, you, there's, there's, there's definitely ups and downs from, a, you know, from, a, um, uh, yeah, um, staff training. Perspective. Jan, you have a quick comment? Yes. Uh, there are also operational reasons going the other way. Maybe that a lot of tools you may want to use on your images can only work on files. So for example, uh, you can't diff a block or character device easily with a lot of tools, so compress them to uh, be, to stream them and so on. And well, why can't you compress to stream a I block use, device? I do, I do that. So for example, Async also will refuse by default to deal with, uh, to diff them on a content level instead of a ZFS history level. Mark, did you have something? I was going to say, um... Uh, and I'm recording Z vols from one block size to another using a like QU image. I'm going directly to this like slash dev slash artist. Like I'm specifying the Z vols path, not the ZFS path. So I thought you can do some operations on the Z vol itself. Oh, or are we yeah, talking about absolutely. slightly, slightly different thing here is what he's mentioning. I may be okay. confused. Bear in mind <clears throat> that we're also talking across host platforms, Mark. Mm hmm. So we've got a lot of people. We've got a lot of people in here who are running ZFS on Linux, right? And BSD. So and there's Mac ZFS. And yeah. And so there. My point is, their ZFS versions may be a little bit different and may not necessarily get the same block device that we do in in the Illumos. Um, okay. So, for example, in FreeBSD, there used to be this nasty gotcha with the uh, VDEF mode where it's either a, a pure character device or a geom provider. And the geom provider, the host operating system will taste the partition tables inside the Zvol, for example, and this can then result in, in, in it refusing to override the partition table because uh, there may be somebody using the, this partition. So it refuses to override the block unless you go through the right uh, API to change the partition table or do it on the right device. I'm happy to report that I had that bug for the first year I was using, um, well, mm -hmm. using ZFS seriously in production. But thankfully, and all I got were a lot of log messages and not <laughs> actual, and then the uh, actual is, serious conflict. Is that it used to require a zpool Im export import to uh, for the change to take effect? Uh, yes, those were dark days, but there are like three or four disk mode settings and sys controls, but that's very FreeBSD specific. 
Uh, yes, it is. Stu and Sam, have you I, used any Z-Vols? Have you come up with any clever ways to manage them? I, I, and if you're using QEMU image mark, that's pretty darn cool. Uh, it works on Linux device. and, and OmniOS, but OmniOS is a bit back, backdated, so it doesn't do DMDKs to raw Z-Vols correctly just yet. That's cool. one caveat I found over the time. Since okay. I have to do lots of migrations. Yeah, I have not personally used anything like that, but the uh, the ability to interface with the QEMU image is interesting. Yeah, and I've done it a couple ways, but nothing that's production worthy. It's more of a one off to for development testing. Regarding the right. QEMU tools, does it include uh, unpacking and packing? ZFS snapshots versus QCO2 uh, snapshots? So you know, what I'm generally doing, I'm converting. So what in my migration, I usually convert from a VirtualBox VDI file to a Zvol. And there's three different ways that I know to do that. There is the first method, which is PFXAT QMUG convert, you know, source image to output image. And basically, as far as I'm aware, all that I give it is the VDI file. And then the after I pre-created the ZFS uh, Zvol, I then pipe that into the uh, slash dev slash rdisk slash zvol name blah 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 and that writes everything that's in that vdi file to the zvol and then i just uh, configured the vm hypervisor to use that zvol which, which uh, utility from uh VirtualBox, there's, there's three three utilities there's the yes. pf is at QEMU, which is not a virtual box utility it's a QEMU tool of course and that's just specifying the vdi file and the zvol the second method is to use vbox manage clone and but before you do that, you pre-create pre the zvol, you assign a BMDK shim file that points to the zvol, and then you do PFSEC clone medium, or PFSEC VBox manage clone medium, and specify your input and output images. And then the third method is using DD. And the fastest one I found is QU image. Um, but all three methods should be able to get you from one uh, VDI type for, or uh, virtual hard drive format to another. So one of the reasons why there's such a multitude of these formats is that a lot of hypervisor host systems lack such a rich file system as ZFS. So the hypervisors, we uh, came up with their own poor man's implementation of snapshotting and sparse uh, storage. QCAL copy on write, go ahead. Exactly, QCAL copy on write, VMDK, VDI, and so on. They have simple, uh, basically direct map modes, they have block modes, they have snapshotted modes, depending on the format. And if you are used to ZFS, you may think, why would I want this there? Because it's just annoying to have it there, but uh, it's still oftentimes, if all you have is a single X3 file system, it's, and you have to work inside these constraints, then uh, these features are Life changes for yep. host operators. One orthogonal point, uh, Beehive does have a, an open review and project for native QCOW2 support and other format support, the VDSK, such that you can aim mm -hmm. at a vendor provided appliance that you're, you would void your warranty with but, if you change the format to like a ZFall. So anyway. There's that. But a full-featured QCO2 uh, import-export tool would have to basically start with the first snapshot to uh, convert it, feed it into a Zvol or a file on a ZF, do a snapshot, then do the next one and so on to really preserve the snapshotting and sparse allocation instead of just decoding it into a raw file or raw byte stream and dumping out it on a Zvol um, trusting in ZFS to have at least a zero length encoding compression enabled. Free BSD users, have you used, I believe it is uh, GeomDD or GDD? It's a, a Geom native DD. Um, the the gym or the CamDD? CamDD, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, that is something different. It's at the Cam is the FreeBSD SCSI like storage stick. 
and there you you gain access, for example, to deep queuing, which is normally not available uh, via the character interface. So, for example, you can specify not just the um, right block size for the DD, but also the queue depth and so on. Interesting. Which so can that's make a, yes, a huge difference. It. <laughs> yes, it's, it can make a huge difference, like a factor 10 or so, when doing it over high latency iSCSI storage um, okay. to replicate disks across data centers, for example. That would benefit from some syntax examples for the future. Uh, so exactly, they are there. You that's just well, looked at them. How many decades old are these? Uh, there's a occasional. Uh, they're, they're, they're there. Uh, okay, okay, excellent. Uh, do we have a Z ball here? They're, they're the yeah, yeah, example. the depth. I know. Do we have a Z ball? Uh, no worries. The Z ball isn't a chem device. Oh, so we'll see, correct. You might. Oh, and do you see those in GSTAT or not? So yeah, okay. No, do you see them in Chem uh, Control layout? Yeah, no, correct. You wouldn't. Geom Excellent. is not Chem. Okay. These are two different yes, subsystems. Sir. Chem is a layer underneath. Chem is what gives you the pure block storage, which Geom can then interpret and rewrite and transform. For example, partition it, encrypt it, compress or decompress it. Cam gets you access to blocks. Got it. So as for examples, boom, there they are. Um, do we want to talk right amplification or is that perhaps for another meeting where we each bring our success stories? I have very much heard simply go with 16K or 32K for a disk for a disk image or Zval specifically for a virtual machine. There was a bit of a mm -hmm. kerfuffle about Proxmox going with the default of 8K with Zvols, although there's apparently a review to bump up the native default. Uh, One question size I to would have, okay, go which ahead. is closely related is, do you really want in a virtualized environment ZF is inside the gas because why do you want to have all the nice virtualization functions duplicated? Isn't it good enough to get the um, correctness and integrity guarantees which ZFS gives you at the block storage level and then put a dumb file system on top to make sure of your, uh, to make good use of your idealized blocks because ZFS will never expose the virtual file system on a Zvol or on a file to torn writes, to um, bit rot and so on. It will catch all of the normal nastiness, uh, modify in place file system with just metadata journaling, isn't prepared to handle at scale. Uh, I would observe that you can absolutely have a corrupt uh, guest uh, modify in place file system and then have ZFS dutifully preserve it for you. Yes, uh, but yes, you could roll back. ZFS, but... no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, what go I'm ahead. saying is that if the guest operating system commits a write to the virtualized ZFS storage, yep. it will never have it even in a power loss scenario or kernel panic that after the system reboots, it will observe a partial block write or something or an corrupted block. ZFS will not store this for you. So there are a lot less uh, cases the file system has to handle and recover from. And you already have your snapshotting and replication at the block level. No question. Hmm? No question. <laughs> no, so, not so, disagreeing at all. Uh, and it allows you to uh, have slimmer guests because uh, let's be honest, ZFS okay. is still a heavy rate file system. All right. Other thoughts there? I heard maybe John chime in. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm. I maybe I'm disagreeing or not. I'm not 100% sure with what I heard there. That's why we're having this discussion. ZFS will happily store 
a bad files, a bad virtual, uh, bad, bad virtual machine file system. Of course, um, but it will not corrupt it on write by writing only half a block. That I agree with. Or by lying about having persisted a block and then rebooting. If the guest operating system does not complete its rights correctly, ZFS will happily store a incomplete or bad file system setup. Of course. That's that's all I was. I, that's all I wanted to, to be clear about. That's what that I. That isn't, I, 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 I isn't that magic. And 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 if I were to chime in on part of the last topic. I Please. almost always use uh, 4K block sizes on everything. Um, I have users running all types of various virtualized operating systems and trying to uh, optimize block size uh, becomes very difficult um, unless you can actually track it to an OS, which also becomes difficult when you're DDing things in and out all the time. Uh, so I tend to hang around with uh, with an 8K block size. The majority of my systems have uh, NVMe cache. I have also had some luck. It wasn't discussed here. Um, I have also been playing around with the special device. Oh, um, have you? Good. Go ahead. Yes, please. And it seems to work quite nicely. But oh, please, please, please make sure that you have the block size is correct because if you lose one, you can't remove it otherwise. And I lost a volume that way. Oh, okay. I so think you uh, had to destroy and recreate the pool from backup to yes. fix it. Yes. That okay. was a gotcha that I did not fully understand the first time I put it together. So that that's a uh, um, that was a lesson hard learned. And, I heard you and, quick, uh, go ahead. I was a quick question, John. Did yes. you say you were using? 4K or 8K? Yeah, I, that's my question too. You've said both 4 and 8. Um, I tend to use 4K. I will use 8K, um, but it can cause problems on systems that don't support, that don't like an 8K boot volume. Windows. Um, uh, especially SQL-based Windows. A different... I'm, I'm trying to not point fingers. Yeah, but others but, will do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> but you can uh, even use a one megabyte uh, ZFS block size and still report a 4K block size to the guest. You're inviting write amplification that way? Yeah, well, I, yeah, we don't, I don't try, I try not to do that. I have enough other issues. And the other problem with uh, 4 or 8K is that you, especially with 4K these days, you can forget about using any kind of parity rate effectively, because if you have an A shift of 12, so no allocation smaller than 4K, and you pass through 4K block devices, and you have, let's say, a rate 6 so, or rate Z2, that means for each 4K, you also write uh, two 4K parity blocks. Yeah, I will be. No, we're we're getting a little. Maybe we're getting off topic. I don't know. Yeah, um, but, I almost always use mirrors these days. I rarely use yes. RAID. RAID Z um, is incompatible with these small values because to get reasonable allocation and uh, efficiency and throughput on that uh, RAID Z, you have to have a block size on the volume large enough so that the block can be striped across the data drifts and the parity can be allocated as well. Yeah. Um, something I'd like to bring up I'm, 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 I'm li as I'm listening, um, it, there's a, it seems like, there, and I know I have been through this, there's an awful lot of having to learn everything for yourself. And it, it, I don't know, there was a kind, I don't remember the gentleman's name that made the comment, um, a comment about, well, do you create Z vols and then put files in Z vols, or do you have files in data sets or, you know, how do you, 
how do you set things up? What works best for you? Uh, everyone's environment is different. It seems like, and, and, you know, I'm the worst offender here because I am not volunteering right now. Um, maybe someday when I retire, but you know, it seems like a, 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 a chart or some, some form of, you know, this best practices, works, best practices, this works best under these conditions type of thing. Um, and with all of that being said, one of the issues, I have very few issues. Don't take this, don't take this the wrong way. I have very few issues with ZFS. Um, it may not perform the best, but in general, that doesn't matter. What matters is reliability. And one of the things that I am always getting hit up with is, well, do you, you know, can we, you know, scale up versus scale out and HA. And the solutions are, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm offending somebody, the solutions are one off at best. Um, I don't think I have two systems that have an ex the exact same HA setup on them. Right. Yeah. Yep. And I, I really, it would be really nice if we could present a unified API for doing these, this type of thing. I know we have all kinds of tools to allow it to happen. But uh, once again, everyone is off figuring out how to do it for themselves. Um, how are you defining HA, let alone the implementation? Exactly cool. Man management, de management decides that HA means they don't get a call. Okay. okay. Nothing, goes, nothing goes down. Yep. Okay. And, you know, <laughs> NFS is sort of easy. CTL is not as easy as people might make it out to be. Um, it's, anyways, I... Maybe you should explain what CTL means to the non-ZFS, uh, uh, non-FreeBSD folks. Please. Uh, see, I'm sorry, uh, iSCSI. Uh, Cam target layer, which happens to do backing storage that's used by iSCSI and Fiber Channel for what it's worth. Yeah. So that's why- And potentially PS even locally Cam. to hypervisors. Uh, yes, as Jan has explored on other calls. Go, who in, so, jumped in there with that, Mark? Or, go ahead. I think that's why B PF Sense shows cam loading at the beginning of every time I see the boot up sequence. I didn't realize, okay. Uh, yeah. Cam uh, is the fundamental like storage of FreeBSD as we touched on with Jian versus mm -hmm. cam, but the cam target level is, an, is a very proven piece of plumbing used for uh, shared virtualized storage, so be it the IceCozy, be it Fiber Channel and local storage. Go ahead, Andrew, was it? It was, but I totally lost it. It's fine. <laughs> my, my bad, sorry. Sorry. The discussion was around um, unified interfaces to high availability storage and what does that mean to whom? Okay, that is its own topic. Yes, All its own, yeah. or a few there. That that um, is a that is a consultancy organization waiting to happen. Exactly. Yes. Because you get uh, into deep systems integration tasks. We are at one hour. Does anyone have a hard stop? There have been complaints from spouses about these going three hours, and I have no desire to go three hours today. However, uh, this is also your time. Um. In the course of this, did any ideas pop into heads that just can be quick and addressed as a group? And the just, other, go ahead, what was that? Just points of discussion for future uh, meetings. Absolutely. Like, and, um, go ahead. Ask, uh, SCSI, um, as sync, um, asymmetric lures and so on. So accessing, CTL via multiple paths, uh, multiple import protection for ZFS so that you can just have your disks on a SAN or some, it could be as simple as just JBots with SAS expanders and two head ZFS servers and you 
can quickly fail over. It could be as complex as these two systems then talking over a non-transparent PCI Express bridge and the passive node forwarding requests to the active node. Okay. Yep. I know on the post ID property. Eh? Go ahead, Andrew. I know on the Solaris side of things, which we've discussed is not exactly open ZFS. Um, so maybe it's different, but there is a check when you import a pool as to whether or not this pool is actively exported on something else. And you can yes. see it if you if you try to import a it's pool. Still there. It's still there. This is the multi-import protection I was mentioning. Uh, I mentioned the problem with it is that for automatic failover, you have to break the safety uh, lock Correct. to forcefully import the pool and ignoring the fact that it wasn't intentionally exported if the previous primary node crashed, uh, you have to shoot it in the head. Yes. And then take over the disks. And for example, you could use something like a quorum using uh, the SCSI persistent reservations on your disks so that you always have a quorum because you will only have two servers. But if you use SCSI commands on your disks, but then you really have to have fully featured SCSI disks. You can no lo longer use uh, SATA drives because they will not be able to uh, store persistent reservations. But it also increases the level of knowledge of those people that end up having to support the system. When exactly. Goes wrong. And you quickly reach a point where your failover solution has more failure cases than Absolutely. the whole system had before the, you introduced high availability. Correct. And, <laughs> Go ahead. And, yeah. um, it, it, and in kind of in line with that, because I've done the OCF realm as well, bouncing back and forth and toward mm -hmm. export exporting. But the ability to have a read-write import and a read-only import would be fantastic. Um, um, the problem with the read no. import of a written pool is that um, if the writer doesn't know about this, unless you're basically implementing this like the uh, who level snapshotting, the super snapshots, or however they're called. I just forgot the real name for them. Is that um, the reader would have to deal with invalidated data because the host deallocated it, reallocated, and then the old root can no longer reach any valid data. Oh, that's, that's a very good point. Yes. So um, you can't really do that unless you so, always just re-import the pool, basically, right. if you encounter this. And for that, because the checksum, oh, you really have to do it on every checksum error and trust the checksum. It doesn't then, sound like a feasible. So then you way. have to have another layer above it to abstract that. Yeah, away. at that point, why aren't you just yeah. forwarding the VFS operations? Oh, there's a protocol for that. And Stu, just a point of order, I've done many read-only imports where read-write would not work, especially when people say virtualize on, a, mm -hmm. on VMware or VMDK or VMFS, et cetera, or a hardware yeah. RAID card. But, but doing uh, them on, having them in a active passive mode from a clustering uh, view of it, where you can say, hey, this is my write node, all updates happen here, and I've got 20 reader nodes that can attach to that same storage as a single source well, of truth. It's an the, abstraction layer that I was trying to shortcut. Mm -hmm. But it would be you a can't really, really. You would have to have a. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just saying that'd be a really cool feature in some scenarios that I've had in the past. So either it would be asynchronous and basically catch up on failure and best effort which is a really sloppy form of replication and failure, uh, or it would have to be a, a form of uh, synchronous uh, ahead of time logging. Basically the intent log is synchronously uh, broadcasted to all 
a follower similar to a Postgres uh, synchronous replication. Right. Th think of it. Think of it in the realm of a CDN. So a CDN I doesn't require that level of uh, precise application at the file system level. But it could, and that's one of those things that if it, if the efficiencies make sense, it's something that is a pretty cool value add to right. it. But well, it may not just make from sense. Your, I would presume that you're coupling your systems too tightly at that point, and you would get into scalability and reliability problems. And it's better to have an is just a snapshot and replicate loop running with some kind of maybe throttling so that's, that it doesn't that, that's, how, that's how that's how we currently do the live to vod process to capture the chunks so that's exactly and, what you just described is exactly the operation i'm doing now just and if to you figure out alternate methodologies that may help somebody else in a different situation, whether it's mm -hmm. and if you or use, something else. I didn't finish. And you use the phrase live to what? Live to VOD, so video on demand. Okay. So I'm watching live TV, it's in chunks. I capture mm -hmm. the last MASH episode <laughs> into a VOD asset from there directly. I do that with a snapshot. Okay. And Jan, other comments there? Yeah, at that point, unless, okay, what is a special use case, but for something like, let's say, a package repository, you may want to expose the snapshotting mechanism so that you get from one uh, snapshot to the net next in a transactional fashion, so that, for example, all packages and the index file are always in sync on a mirror. So a mirror is either up to date or at least a consistent stale replica. But you do not get the annoyances, for example, with FreeBSD package mirrors right. had for a few years where you could get a new index, but the package it's referencing has not yet been replicated. And then you get a, either a file not found or if, it, if a file name hasn't changed, but the content has, you get a checksum error and you're left with, oh, you can't install this package. And uh, you know how exactly to that. I think they're doing it. Go ahead, Stu. Okay. And then you go into the versioning of, oh, I got my old one and my new one, you know, and with a new reference in it as well. So no, I really like that idea. I simply push my website up with a ZFS send. It's like, well, here it is, there it goes. And the unprivileged send is stunning. That is awesome. That is a, a, one of its greatest gifts, just saying. So for example, what you could do then is you basically have your uh, replication data set and you would just, whenever you finish a replication, you would take a read only clone uh, to a location or m mount the snapshot exactly into a specific location uh, so that, you can atomically replace the direct root directory, or you could even just use a sim link you atomically replace to point to the right as auto mounted snapshot location. If you know that your application doesn't mind following a sim link, which few uh, file servers like Nginx and other web servers or even old FTP servers do. Okay. So it just works. These are exactly the topics I was hoping people would launch into. And they segue nicely into documentation because production users mm -hmm. are often forced to maintain internal documentation. And Mark, you've been excellent at posting notes in the chat, which then went to the doc and then you corrected them there. So uh, it copy paste is funny. So um, copy I did friend. the example math on um, minimum optimally laid out uh, volume sizes, uh, according to my understanding for a RAID Z2 with 10 disks. That's documented somewhere in your ecosystem? In my ecosystem, uh, it's taken from some comment I found in the code years ago and then okay. computed out. So basically, uh, if you have 4K physical block size in your storage uh, and you 
pick the minimum um, A shift accordingly. So you can't allocate smaller than 4K. Uh, then unless you accept padding and so on, you will have to have a minimum volume uh, block size of 32 kilobytes because you get 4K from each Stripe data disk, which is 10 minus the parity disk. So 10 minus two for a RAID Z2 which leaves you with eight times 4K, so 32K plus the two times 4K parity for each okay. block. There you go. If you have a link to that code, do it. Because uh, I, I just realized- I don't have a link to the code. I just remembered the formula and computed it in chat. Beautiful. Oh, no, and that's what you put above. Okay, so that said, let me bring that down. Uh, you are the eyes and ears of the developer. They are just doing their thing on their schedule and they they benefit from observations in the wild like we're doing. And that's the entire raison d'etre of this call. So if anything, keep it coming. Over time, let's identify who wants to, for, for example, take ownership of various documentation or wiki or Wikipedia page or manual page. For example, as I led with, I think the encryption manual page is completely ambiguous on the word key because it never met mentions if it's a encryption key, a decryption key, a password also known as a key, et cetera, et cetera. So let's, um, if anyone at this point wants to say, hey, I care about you know topic A, B, or C, say it, or let's just organically follow this wherever it takes us. And if it hasn't been said, thank you, Jan, John, Stu, Sam, Jesse, Mark, and uh, those who have had to leave already for attending and making this happen because yes, uh, John, above all, I hear your frustration in like, why are we each reinventing the wheel on this? And we've all been there. We're all, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, forced to do that for want of docs. The books are quite good from Michael W. Lucas and uh, Alan Jude. There are some dated Solaris books. And I will end with perhaps a quick update on OpenZFS on Windows. So Jorgen dropped a new RC candidate release yesterday. So I spun up my Windows machine. And if you can see this, I am running AGA. We are still only seeing uh, your browser window. Uh, oh, right. Oh, let me, oh, you it's, only oh, shared your browser window. You no, didn't yeah. share your whole screen. No, you should see it if you're watching the video participants, but let me stop the share. So I am moving my camera and I have been. So I've got uh, a Windows 10 system with a dedicated SSD and a whole lot of reflection there. My apologies. Uh, I've got AGA test suite hitting a dedicated SSD Tank D and uh, Zpool IOSTAT running. And with the last release, this would fill up the storage device without any tangible uh, data. It would simply not free up space. So that appears to be fixed given that this has been running about 12 hours and I still see a more or less full up. Uh, empty disk over as tank D, if you can see those. I concern is this to your flash blocks. Yes, I know. Um, although <laughs> Jorgen pointed out that perhaps uh, the uh, the reads and writes might be cached by Windows. So that's a whole different topic we've touched on. Anyway, uh, shall we call it there? Uh, if I can get one quick question Please. then. Absolutely. Uh, I'm pretty sure Marty aware of this but i just wanted to confirm the uh the alumos folks are still maintaining mm. their own separate branch right they they haven't come in and rebased off of the, the open cfs code base yet my understanding is that the alumos side of things um we're we're taking in the new stuff that's <clears throat> that is being added on the open cfs side so we're not growing that deviation, but that there's not a, where it deviates, there's not a effort to come in and to whole, you know, whole ham, bring it in. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, that's kind of how I understood it. I just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Would no cherry picking be the right term for that? You're bringing in features. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. 
I mean, you know, I, I, I think it's, I think there is a desire to pull it together at some point, but there's no plan for that. And also for yet another, let's finish. Hey, uh, congratulations, Oxide on shipping and Lumos and Beehive and open ZFS, well, in this case, ZFS-based uh, solution. Congratulations to that team. They've been working on that a very long time and Patrick has been very active on the Beehive calls. Any final, final thoughts? I have this currently as every other week because it's falling in place of what was a Beehive developers call and certain developers were simply not available. So we've put that on hold and segued into this. Um, if you have any feedback on the time slot, let me know. And any feedback on the format is also appreciated. And thank you so, so much for updating notes in context. And I invite you to give a quick sweep of what we've done, if, any, if I got any uh, acronyms wrong, et cetera. And I wish you a great remainder of the week. See you guys. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Have a good one. Thanks. Thank you. You are welcome. Take care.